You are watching The Jenny Lynn Show, and I'm Jenny Lynn Gleave, your host. And today my guest is Mr. Stephen Tim Quigley, Jr. And he is another amazing person. He has done so much that I'm unsure of which tag to attach to his name. So we'll let him decide that. But he is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer at Azores TV, Board of Directors at Sister Cities International. He went to Harvard University, Kennedy School of Government, University of Hawaii, University of Oklahoma, and he's done so much that I'm just going to have him tell you about that. Tim, thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure, Jenny Lynn. Nice I to am, be with you. Thank you. I'm so happy to sit here and learn about what drives someone like you. Well, I guess um, to begin with, I'd, I'd uh, say that I'd describe myself as a, as a businessman, a, uh, a social entrepreneur, um, a pilot, a uh, former uh, military officer. And uh, as I was leaving the service, the U.S. Navy, after about a uh, 31-year career, uh, the service is very good about putting you through a, a, a readjustment or transition training process. And typically what the intent is to help you focus on what your job or your employment opportunities might be after that. And it was interesting as I went through that process, what I came to is that my content is service, is really focused on providing service. Right. And so that's really helped drive me both in business and, and my activities in the community. Oh, good answer. I mean, I'm really happy. <laughs> I think that very few people even stop to figure out what it is that really, you know, drives them and they mm -hmm. just go through the motions. So someone who went to Harvard and all these universities that you um, attended, mm -hmm. how did you or why did you end up in the military? Was this before or after? Well, actually, uh, uh, it's uh, actually the other, the other way around. I, uh, I w grew up in the 1950s and 1960s, and in those years it was very prestigious. It was before the, the national nervous breakdown of the mid-60s. It was very prestigious to aspire to the military academies for your college experience. And so when I was in high school, I actually attended a, a parochial Catholic high school right. that, that was affiliated with a junior reserve officer training candidate program. And I competed for and was selected um, to attend the U.S. Naval Academy. So okay. I actually left home at 17 and when um, I've often described most people grow up with their roots in the local community. Uh, at 17, I started rooting at the national level. And then after I retired 30 some years later, I came to Silicon Valley to develop my, my local roots. And so it was really attending the Naval Academy and getting a uh, engineering and science background uh, that ultimately as I progressed in my career, I wanted to circle back around and fill out the humanities and the, uh, and the arts and culture components. And that's what led me to uh, attend classes at the University of Hawaii, attend classes at the University of Oklahoma, and then participate in a senior um, executive career program at uh, Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Very accomplished. Young man. It, uh, very fortunate, <laughs> and uh, life has taken me on a very interesting path. Right. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about you as a child. How would you describe Tim? Um, I would describe Tim as uh, serious. I loved books, and I visited the world through books. Mother introduced me to a book series in the early 1950s, and each month we got, it was the Book of the Month Club, but it actually was a Book of the Month Club around Catholic saints. You know, we were, I grew up in a Catholic, Irish Catholic family environment, and um, so each month I would wait for, with bated breath for that book, and it would 
tell me the stories of the Japanese martyrs uh, during the 19, or the 1500s. It would tell me the stories of the fifth and sixth century. And so I became aware of the world uh, through that. Uh, so uh, I participated in normal sports. Uh, I was a Cub Scout, a Boy Scout. And yeah. Again, had early introduction to uh, community involvement and service. It was so it was that faith experience, that uh, that youth service experience, and and this uh, awakening through uh, my intellectual curiosity through books that uh, I think really formed my high school years, wow. or grade school and high school years. Yeah, I really believe that about books. I was someone who was a ferocious reader also. Yeah. Which was the book series, you remember? Well, it was a Catholic, it was a book series around Catholic saints. Uh -huh. And so it would both um, personalize your faith through l learning the examples of the individual who was focused on in that book, but it also covered the world. So. Um, so it, ha it, it spoke to me in many different um, levels. Right. That I think really helped me um, when I think about what I did during my college years and in my, my 20s, uh, as I became acquainted with the world through my own personal experiences, I would start off with some connection that would take me back to one of those individuals in those books, um, you know, when I was seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. That's awesome. I think one anecdote that's, uh, that uh, might be interesting to some of your viewers is, um, I don't know if you remember the movies uh, Grumpy Old Men and Grumpier Old Men from yes. the mid-1990s. Yes. Well, I'm actually from that town. Ah. It's a small riverboat town. Um, actually, it's a German community named after a Native American in the Norwegian state right on the Mississippi uh, River, and that's Wabasha, Minnesota. And the interesting uh, data point for me is that yeah. I'm actually um, the son of the two Irish families that happened to be in that German town named after that Native American That's awesome. in that Norwegian state. So people would often ask me in the, the 1960s, why would you be so energized um, over the civil rights movement? And I said, well, I, I knew prejudice in, a, in, a, in an interesting sort of way growing right. up yes. in that Irish Catholic in that that German town, Norwegian yeah. community. So. Interesting, Walter Matthau, Jack Lemmon, Sophia Loren. Absolutely. Yeah, I love those movies. Yeah. So you are involved with Sister Cities International. Do you want to tell us what that's all about? I and do, how, and it's and actually how you're involved. Yeah, and I, I, I do, and it's actually connected to my uh, life's path. I spent, as I've mentioned, 31 years in the. Uh, in the Navy and service to the nation, and I'm sure we'll chat about that a little bit later in the conversation. But um, there was one gentleman uh, at the outset of my uh, career in the Navy that had a very big impression on me, and that is uh, President Eisenhower, General Eisenhower. Okay. And he has intersected several times for me in my own personal life's path. A number of, uh, one of the last assignments I had uh, in my career in the N Navy was as course president for the NATO Defense College in Rome, which he created. His vision was by introducing the leaders of all the armed forces uh, and having them come together in a school year of, of uh, ex uh, ex joint or shared experience together would actually help promote peace and understanding because rather than uh, pulling the trigger, you'd dial the phone and, mm. and talk to your, your friend. Concept, yeah. Well, Sister Cities International was ac is actually an initiative which he started at, an, at a presidential summit in the White House during his term of office. And it was that same philosophy of connecting people at the sidewalk level, people to people connection, that really today when you, when you hear Secretary Clinton speaking and she talks of soft power, that's what we're talking about, people to people connection. Okay. Uh, we are the citizen diplomats of the nation and his vision was that the, the more you enable citizens to connect at the sidewalk level, at the city level, that we're actually promoting world peace far better than a summit once a year between 20, 20 or 15, 15 people. So Sister Cities International birthed in 1956 out of, wow. that, uh, out of that national 
uh, summit at the White House. Yes. And today has grown as a umbrella organization over the United States, where in 600 cities uh, participate in the national network of sister cities, connecting to over 2,000 cities around the globe. A and awesome. this is, uh, we promote um, uh, one connection, people to people connection, uh, arts exchange, culture exchange, religious interaction, um, uh, youth programs, yeah. uh, both at the high school and the uh, college level, exchange programs, sports interactions and frankly economic development because of all of these connections it provides a more vibrant uh, flow between cities which enables cities to increase the quality of life in their localities through that that coupling or or as we use in the in the community that twinning of those two cities so um, uh, for instance I'm I live in San Jose here in the valley we've got uh, 15 cities in Santa Clara County and uh, San Jose makes up arguably 53 to 56 percent of the population. Right. And, and, and uh, we have seven sister cities. And okay. I'm president of the San Jose Dublin Sister City Program at the local level. Okay. And also a member of the National Board of Directors for, for all of the sister cities throughout the country. And our intent is to help grow and sustain these linkages and how a sister city gets started is typically a couple of citizens like you and me and yeah. we might have an interest or a connection and um, as you indicated in your introduction I'm currently chairman of Azores TV which is a for-profit broadcast company it specifically serves the island population of the Portuguese uh, American community here in the United States and the reason is that most people don't realize that 85 percent of all Portuguese in the United States come from the islands yet what ethnic programming was provided that is currently provided happens to focus on mainland Portuguese or Brazilian Portuguese so I came to this realization through sisters through the sister city connection as a, as an example to you of how these types of things do promote uh, connection and interaction and, and ultimately uh, help promote a, a better quality of life for, for both sides of the equation. I think that's amazing. Yeah. I think the unfortunate thing is an organization like this that is doing so much good in the world, people hardly ever hear about. Absolutely. And then we, every day we turn our radios on, all we hear is all this chaos. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could switch the tables and then talk about these wonderful things regularly and less about all the negative, oh, non-productive stuff that we give so much airtime to? Absolutely. And I cannot tell you the examples uh, that you would find, the rich examples. I was just uh, Monday of this week, I was in San Francisco in the mayor's office talking with their coordinator and their sister cities. They have 18 connection points. And you can imagine... Uh, the stories that uh, would come out of those 18 connection points at the youth level, you know, at the cultural level, the arts level, and the business level that I think that would, uh, would inspire rather than uh, build fear in the, in the population. So it's certainly something we, we should uh, work towards. Yes, I agree. So you are the perfect guy for this job because <laughs> you've uh, been a veteran for 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. And you've done so many different jobs. You've been CEO for so many different companies and organizations mm -hmm. that I would imagine you bring so much connections, experience, and leadership to this role. Tell me about the one job that you have had in your life or organizations that you were involved in that you are most passionate about. I'm sure you've liked them all, but why did this one if there is one, why is it that that one made such an impact on you or the reason why it's been so important to you? I'm not saying the others weren't, but mm. is there one that stands out more than the others? Well, that's a good question yeah, because I actually personally believe that you need to live in the now, uh, not look to the past, value the past experience and put that into your now and not be too forward looking we need to be forward-looking, but not too forward-looking, because I think people don't spend enough time in the now. Okay. So I would, uh, you know, I would normally answer that question by saying, 
I'm having a great time with Azores TV, and I'm I'm totally engaged with Sister Cities International. Right. But I, I will give you one anecdote that goes back to uh, 19, uh, 1991. Okay. And that was uh, I had just completed my term of office as commanding officer at Moffett Field right here in Silicon Valley in, in Mountain View. And uh, that had been a very, um, very interesting period of time would, would be a, uh, an understating way to say that. Mm -hmm. um, I took over in 1989, in August of 1989. Locally, we had a medfly infestation a month later. Two months later, we had an earthquake, the Loma Prieta earthquake, which Moffett Field managed the recovery of. Okay. Uh, that November, the wall in Berlin fell. And about a year later, uh, we uh, participated in uh, Gulf One. Mm -hmm. And what most people don't realize here in the valley in, in uh, 1991, Gulf One was um, the first time that there was a direct connection between the field of battle and Silicon Valley because it was the first high-tech war. So Storm and Norman or his agent would <laughs> call by day and tell us what stuff to get from what companies by night and he would send in a C5 in the middle of the night. W during the day we'd drive out and pick up the stuff from the individual wow. companies, put it in the boxes and load it on the C5 and send it on out to the war, war zone. So it was a fabulous experience, but that's not the anecdote I'm going to talk about. It was with that backdrop that I transferred uh, at the end of that term to Rome, Italy for a uh, seven-month uh, course as course president at yes. the NATO Defense College. And this was really the first time that I, in an academic sense, was able to make that connection, as General Eisenhower had thought about. And within four days of arriving in Rome for that course, Gorbachev freed the Baltics. And our co course subject matter that we were to work on that year, we were given 15 options of what was going to happen with the Soviet Union. The 16th one wasn't even in that list, which was that it would go away. And by Christmas Day, four months later, the Soviet Union had become history and the world had erratically changed. To me, that was the most exhilarating fabulous four months because Whoa. I had had that backdrop of the two years of watching what we were doing make a contribution at the local level and the national level and then uh, be able to experience that uh, in four months. That is truly yeah. amazing. So you were right in the heart of all these monumental historical yeah, changes. And we were studying, we were actually studying the subject of how was it going to happen, you know, what option would occur, and the one we didn't think of, that it would go away completely, was the, was the 16th option. That's because you were reading all those books about <laughs> the saints. <laughs> that's probably so. <laughs> that is, I mean, I think that's something that you would always, you know, make you excited to think that you it were does. such a part of the big action. Absolutely. So you were a naval officer, and you mm -hmm. were also a pilot. I am. Which, um, when did you stop flying, or do you oh, still I, fly? I still fly occasionally, you still but fly. not, uh, I never flew for, um, for a career outside of the Navy. I flew, I, I really have always considered myself a naval officer whose business was being a pilot. Okay. Okay. There's a, um, many of my colleagues would describe themselves as Navy pilots. Okay? Right. I think of myself as a naval officer who was a pilot. But uh, I will say I had three, I'm a combat veteran. I served three t tours of duty in Vietnam. Yes. Uh, during the, the, the heavy periods, I guess is what we'd call them, the 1970 through 72 periods, the real heavy period of the, of the, uh, 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 of the uh, conflict itself. And, uh, but I, I'm very blessed because I'm one of the few U.S. military members who had two tours of duty in Vietnam. One during the conflict, which was horrific, okay? I mean, war is horrific. There's, there, there's no good war, there's no bad war, there's no nuclear war, there's no conventional war. When you're in war, it's horrific. But about uh, four years after the fall of Vietnam, uh, began the great 
uh, refugee exodus from Vietnam. Right. And we, if you recall, or you yes, may not recall, yes, but no. the, the boat people tried to make their escape from the new, and our role, uh, the president determined, was to help find, locate, ca uh, not capture, but uh, rescue, and then help relocate the Vietnamese people. So for me, that was just a, a spectacular, uh, uh, I, I was in my young 20s, uh, 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 mid to late 20s at the time, and so I had a very defining experience. In, uh, one, conflict <laughs> and the importance of, of trying to eliminate or minimize conflict in the world. But the other is uh, alivening this, this issue of humanitarian uh, giving. Right. Uh, that I think is so central to the American psyche that, uh, you know, it's there in every nation, I'm sure, yes. it, it's, it's human. But we as a nation somehow, because of our, the uniqueness of our birthing and how we've experienced our nationalhood, uh, really um, grip uh, the humanitarian element of society. And I, I think that has had a large influence on the types of service that I've chosen after I left national service. Whenever I'm doing a show where the person has got all this wonderful information to share, the time flies. I have to ask you this question, though. How come some people come back from the war? You've been in two war. You've been in two mm -hmm. wars, with post-traumatic stress, and some people don't. Why do you think that happens? Well, I think you're. I think we all do. Oh, okay. Okay. I think it's the degree to which oh, okay. you. Uh, I don't think you. I couldn't describe to you, I think a person is irretrievably changed in any kind. When you look at what we're watching going on in mm. the streets of Syria today, I mean, that is just awful. I know. It's awful. But it's one thing to use the word awful. It's another to experience it. And um, I mean, just surviving an explosion in close proximity to you is horrific enough. Actually witnessing and participating in killings or, or seeing uh, killings at some uh, catastrophic experience, especially when most people don't realize that the median age of someone in uniform serving our country is 22.6 years old. So that means that uh, this generation from 17 on has witnessed that sort of stuff firsthand. Uh, it, it doesn't surprise me. It's interesting, when I was in Vietnam, we didn't know the term post-traumatic stress di uh, disorder. disorder. We, we knew we were stressed. We would talk about our stress, but, this, but the nation didn't galvanize to help us. It's only, it, it was actually because we didn't galvanize to help the Vietnam vet that we did such a good job in the 1990s and are doing a great job now in helping folks identify what level of post-traumatic right. st stress disorder. But I think that anyone that goes through something like, whether it's a journalist who's, who's embedded with the troops or whether it's that foot soldier or whether it's that sailor or that airman I can is imagine, affected by it. Because I yeah. haven't gone to a war, but I've had things happen to me in my life that have left indelible marks. Yeah, absolutely. And you just need to smell something that closely resembles that experience mm -hmm. and then you relive it. So someone who's gone to the war mm -hmm. and actually fought and been there while it was all happening. Yeah. I can't imagine how you can ever erase those images and those memories. Were you at any time flying any of the fighter planes that were No, I, uh, my mission was the uh, Maritime Patrol aircraft that okay. flew out of Moffett Field for okay. many, many decades. Yeah. But our mission was surveillance. What we did is, uh, people may recall for those that were uh, of, of age and aware in the 1960s and 70s, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which actually provided logistics support through Laos and Ca Cambodia into South Vietnam from yeah. the North Vietnamese. Well, there was actually a Ho Chi Minh Trail by sea, and it was dows and trawlers that carried same weaponry and supplies by sea. And our mission was to locate them while they were still in the high seas and then track them so that the moment they came within um, South Vietnamese international waters, we would call in the fighter pilots to blow them uh, uh -huh. out of the water. So that's <laughs> blow that's, them out of the water. Yeah, that was our <laughs> that was our mission no. uh, to do that to interdict the resupply of weapons and that sort of thing. So, um, so we saw it 
every every day whether we were flying or whether we were on the ground. Uh, you could have a rocket attack that would target the, the fuel farms and when one of those farms explodes it sends shock waves that knocks you off your feet. So there are many different forms of experience that folks come back um, from a conflict with that really s speak to the question they gave me. Yes. Well, you know, the, the point of this interview was not to go down no. this road, but it's so fascinating how could I how could I deviate? You know, I'm enjoying mm -hmm. hearing about it so much. And you're obviously, I mean, probably one of the most accomplished people I've spoken to. And oh, well, I you. have spoken to a lot. But I read your bio, and I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to have enough time tonight to read all of it. And I've been reading it for a while. I would, uh, there are two things I'd like to offer from my experience in, in serving the country in uniform at the national level and working at the local level that I think uh, might help uh, folks have a, expand their, um, beyond their stereotypes. Okay, of what they we might have, have two minutes Okay, um, the first is I co-chaired the Women in the Navy uh, Task Force oh. for President Bush. Yeah. I have, my entire career in the Navy was supporting women empowerment. The second, and most people didn't realize that that was years before it was popular in local society, that right. the armed forces was trying to figure out how to uh, neutralize the gender issue. Um, the, the second is that in, when I was very young, in, in, as a young naval officer, I would often get sailors who were bad acres from their local community where the judge said, you either sign up for the military or I'm putting you in jail. So these young misdirected kids would end up in the military and the military would turn them into healthy, healthy citizens. And that has guided my work in the last couple of years. I'm very active with the San Jose Conservation Corps and the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force and the Police Foundation in San Jose, all because of that experience in the Navy that has connected me to our Latino and, and uh, Asian populations. Here. Thank you so much, Tim. As always, when someone has many good things to tell us and encourage us, we never have enough time to hear it. Thank you so much for watching The Jenny Lynn Show. A great big thank you to my crew that are always here helping me to produce these shows. Thank you to my viewers. And I hope that something that Mr. Quigley has shared with us today will inspire and encourage you. Thank you so much. See you next time.